You all look great. The end of the Republic has never looked better. Folks, there is a new world order that's being created. We need a new global financial order. I urge the international community to embrace its responsibility for creating that new world order, a new world order based upon collective action. When our founders declared a new order of the ages, they were acting on an ancient hope that is meant to be fulfilled. There is a chance for the President of the United States to use this disaster to carry out what his father, a phrase his father used, I think only once, and hasn't been used since, and that is a new world order. Where are we as we think about this time in American foreign policy? Are we at a special moment which is being redefined? Or are we creating a new world order? We're seeing a new world order now being built, a post-World War II world order. And I don't think America can retreat from that. I think we have to balance and adapt and adjust uh, to the realities and the currents of this new world order. We meet here at a moment of testing for Europe and the United States, and for the international order that we have worked for generations to build. You're about to graduate into a complex and borderless world. So I think that everything that we've lived and learned tells us that we will never come out on top if we accept advice from soundbite salesmen and carnival barkers who pretend the most powerful country on earth can remain great by looking inward and hiding behind walls at a time that technology has made that impossible to do and unwise to even attempt. Because this university is blessed with a global vision, and so are you, its graduates now. I believe we, and particularly you, your class, has an incredible window of opportunity to lead in shaping a new world order for the 21st century. What is the new world order? Well, when we talk about the new world order, what we're talking about is a one world government, a one world religion, and a one world financial system. Now, the reason why people refer to this as the new world order is because if we think about it, the current world order, meaning the way things are in the world right now, is that we have separate nations, don't we? We have about 200 separate nations that are sovereign. They have power over their own affairs. They're not all united under one government. And when we think about the current religious state, we have a multitude of religions in this world. We have Christianity and all of its various facets and denominations, but we also have religions like Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism, and these religions are definitely not united. They're separate religions. That's the current order of things. Not only that, but we have different financial systems. Here we use the dollar. If we went to Mexico, we're using pesos. If we go to Canada, we're gonna be on a different dollar, a Canadian dollar. All over the world, there are all these different currencies. So when we talk about the new world order, we're talking about a world in which there's one government, where there's one religion and one financial system. What does new world order mean, and what does it mean for the future? It means uh, new responsibilities uh, to keep the peace, because there's only one superpower left. Of the many reasons given for going to war in the Persian Gulf, one rings out for its soaring, if vague, ideals. 
Mr. Speaker, the President of the United States. President Bush calls it the new world order. What is at stake is more than one small country. It is a big idea, a new world order where diverse nations are drawn together in common cause to achieve the universal aspirations of mankind. With few exceptions, the world now stands as one. The world can therefore seize this opportunity to fulfill the long-held promise of a new world order. We can find meaning and reward by serving some higher purpose than ourselves. A shining purpose, the illumination of a thousand points of light. President Bush's new world order is very much an evolving idea. He may be keeping it vague deliberately. In any case, it is easier to invoke than it is to explain or to implement. Obviously, they are talking about globalization. They are talking about the merging of nations and of continents under an economic system, under a military system, and a governmental system. All of which, of course, the elite would control for their own purposes. The president first spoke of a new world order amid the collapse of communism in Eastern Europe, the revolutions of 1989. But critics observe it is more than just the absence of the Cold War. It is building new institutions to manage crisis and change. If you look at the speech that George Bush made in context, where he talks about a new world order, he's referring to a world where the United States is the one superpower. You see, there used to be two superpowers, the United States and the Soviet Union. But when the Soviet Union fell, you're left with one superpower in the world, the United States. And when the global elites like, you know, George W. Bush or Bill Clinton or any of these people use the term New World Order, that's what they're referring to. That's what they mean by it. In the wake of the Cold War, in a world where we are the only remaining superpower, it is the role of the United States to marshal its moral and material resources to promote a democratic peace. It is our responsibility. It is our opportunity to lead. There's no one else. Today, America is the undisputed superpower. We have climbed a high mountain over these last 200 years to attain that responsibility of being the world's only superpower. There is no doubt about it that today, America is number one militarily economically, scientifically, technologically. We are the one superpower in the world today. Everybody acknowledges that, everybody. That's not controversial. I think it is accurate to say that the outcome of the Gulf War is confirmed that the United States is the sole remaining superpower in the world. We are, whether we like it or not, and I like it, the only superpower in the world. We are the only true superpower in the world. As the world's only superpower, the United States has unique responsibilities that we gladly embrace. Our military has no peer. The odds of a direct threat against us by any nation are low. We spend more money on our military than the next 10 countries put together. It will be your generation's task to respond to this new world. It is America that the world looks to for help. The question each of you will face is not whether America will lead, but how we will lead. Not just to secure our peace and prosperity, but also extend peace and prosperity around the globe. For the first time in history, we have seen a movement, a political and social movement, that is truly global in nature. So it's not just a new order, it's a new world order. And in that sense, it's quite accurate, because uh, this is new in history. When we emerge from this war, we will be the only superpower on Earth. No nation since the Roman Empire will have been so dominant in the world as we will be 
on the day that this conflict ends. If you look at the wars that we're in, 134 wars that we're involved in, that this country has made a decision to attempt to imperialize and deconstruct other countries, destabilize other countries, we can see that we're a country of war now. Why? It's called resources. It's called money. It's called greed. It's called all the things that they want to have that are not ours to have. And it appears to me that if there were anything that I could look at that would show that there is a new world order, is the entanglements that the United States military is involved in from a globalist view that is killing people, destroying countries with no conscience whatsoever. I'm going to show you today how the Bible actually prophesies that one day there will be a one world government, a one world religion, and a one world financial system. There is no doubt that scripture warns of a new world order. There is no doubt about that. Now the Bible tells to prove all things. So in order for me to get up here and make this kind of a claim that the Bible predicts that there's going to be this new world order, then I should be able to show you these things in the Bible. And the place where all three of these elements are found is right here in Revelation 13. So look down at your Bible and first of all in verse 7 I'm going to show you one world government in the Bible. In Revelation 13, 7, speaking of the Antichrist, it says, And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds. Now, kindreds is talking about the different families of the earth. You know, you've heard of someone being, you know, your next of kin. And then he says, and tongues, which the word tongue is just talking about languages and nations. So there we see a one world power, a one world government, where one man, one system is given power over all kindreds and tongues and nations. That is the Bible outlining for us the coming one world government. Look down at verse number eight and you'll see the one world religion. It says in verse eight, and all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him. So we see all people in the earth. We see people who are living in India that today are Hindus, people who are living in the Middle East that today would be Islamic, people living in Western countries who call themselves Christians or Catholic or whatever they call themselves. We see people from all over the world, all nations, all languages, worshiping this man and proclaiming him to be basically God in the flesh. So we're already seeing it today, even before this happens, where religions are starting to merge in a sense and talk about putting aside their differences. If you jump down to verse 16, you'll see the one world financial system. Look at Revelation 13, 16. He causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name, here is wisdom, let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. His number is six hundred, three score and six. Six hundred sixty-six is that number, the, the proverbial six, six, six. And he says that no one on the planet of any nation, any tongue, any people, he says no man will be allowed to buy or sell without this mark. Well, that proves that the whole financial system is going to be united to be able to enforce that one rule for everybody. Nobody can buy or sell. You, you can't buy without his permission, so there's a financial control of the world. One world currency, probably electronic. We already have paper dollars, which are worthless, except for the cost of the paper. Well, if it's electronic, now you even save the cost of the paper. <laughs> you don't even have that. So there's going to be a political, a financial, and a religious control, a one world control of everybody. That is different than what we have today. That is a new world order. That is a one world financial system. So all three of these elements are right here in scripture. Yet there are people out there who when you talk about the new world order or things of this nature, they say, oh, you're a conspiracy theorist. Or you're, you know, you're some kind of a nut. You're paranoid, but wait a minute. Can you really be a Bible-believing Christian and just ignore Revelation 13 when it predicts that these exact things are going to come to pass? And we are seeing it all come together rapidly now toward the fulfillment of this prophecy 2,000 years ago. 
headed for a one world government, a one world religion, a one world currency. It's just, and it, Satan's going to be the mastermind behind all of that. Now, in order to understand the New World Order, we have to understand the subject of Babylon in the Bible. Babylon is a place that's mentioned hundreds of times. And if we go all the way to the beginning, we actually go to a place that's just called Babel. The name Babylon seems to come from the Tower of Babel. And we use the word Babel like he's a babbling idiot. You know, he's talking incoherently because that's where God confused the languages. The Tower of Babel was the first attempt by evil men to usurp the authority of God and to become a godlike state unto themselves. Tower of Babel is probably the first post-flood attempt at a one world government. God said, spread out. Nimrod said, oh no, we're staying here. And God stepped in and broke it up by confusing the languages. See, it's God's will that there be separate nations on this earth. It is not his will that there be a one world government, that all nations unite. So when you understand that the Tower of Babel was the entire world united under a one world government and a one world religion, you really begin to see the spirit of Babylon as it goes through different empires in world history. Now let's fast forward to the city of Babylon. In Daniel chapter 2, the king had a dream and he forgot the dream. And he called his wise guys in and said, whoa, tell me what this means. And they said, oh, tell us what you dreamed. And he said, I forgot the dream. Tell me what I dreamed and what it means. And they said, oh, king, that ain't fair. Nobody does that. And he said, I'm going to kill all of you. And so Daniel comes in to the rescue. God gives him the vision. So Daniel told the king what he dreamed and what it means, which is just real clear evidence. This is straight from God. He said, King, God has revealed it to me. This is what you dreamed and here's what it means. You saw a giant image. The head was gold, the chest and arms of silver, the belly and thighs of brass, the legs of iron, the feet iron and clay mixed together. Then you saw a stone cut out without hands that smote the image on the feet, crumbled the whole thing to powder and the wind blew it away. And that stone grew to become a giant mountain. And the king said, that's right. That's exactly what I dreamed. What does this mean? And Daniel said, King, God has just shown you the future of the world. Now, when we look at these sections of this image, the gold, the silver, the brass, and the iron, it is not a mystery what these four kingdoms are. Because first of all, God comes right out and tells us that Babylon is that head of gold. The image of gold, Daniel told him, King Nebuchadnezzar, you are the head of gold. I mean, we know the Bible tells us that was the first kingdom, the Babylonian kingdom. So we know that the head of gold represents King Nebuchadnezzar and represents the Babylonian Empire because these represent the kings, but they also represent the kingdoms. In verse number 39, he says this, And after thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee. Now we know that other kingdom that came after Nebuchadnezzar was the Medo-Persian Empire. All throughout the book of Daniel, we're told about the Medes and the Persians, and we know that they were the ones that came into power after the nation of Babylon. And it's interesting because in the image there, the Medo-Persian Empire is represented by the breast and the two arms. And those two arms are kind of representing the fact that it's a two-part nation. It's the Medes and the Persians coming together. And it's the kingdom that God said was inferior to the Babylonian Empire, the Medes and the Persians, Darius the Mede, Cyrus the Persian, that's what we're talking about. In verse number 39, Daniel goes on and says, and another third kingdom of brass, which shall bear rule over all the earth. Now we know again from the book of Daniel that that next kingdom was the empire of Greece. The Bible tells us about the king of Grecia and about the realm of Grecia, and it spells that out for us. And of course, historically, we know that the next world empire was that of Alexander the Great. Alexander, known as the Great, was actually Alexander III of Macedon. Alexander the Great conquered all of the known world by the time he was 30, 32 years old, just a young man. Out of yeah. every culture that he, he conquered, he made it quite simple. We're gonna, you're going to do it the Greek way. You're going to learn Greek if you want to be educated. You're going to learn Aristotle's science and astronomy. And you're going to do it our way. And if you don't, well, then we'll just kill you. 
In verse number 40, we're told of the fourth kingdom. And the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron, for as much as iron breaketh in pieces and subdueth all things, and as iron that breaketh all these shall it break in pieces and bruise. So we're told that there's a fourth kingdom, and that fourth kingdom is represented by iron. Now the fourth kingdom is not explicitly named in the book of Daniel, but we know that it's Rome for several reasons. Number one, in Daniel chapter 9, verse 26, it talks about the prince that shall come, destroying Jerusalem, laying it waste, etc. And we know that Rome did that. Not only that, we also know that Rome is that fourth kingdom because there's been a passing of the torch here in this passage where the Persians took over exactly where the Babylonians left off. Then Alexander the Great with the Grecians, he defeated the Persians and picked up right where the Persians left off. Well, the question is, who picked up right where the Greeks left off with world empire, with global conquests? Obviously, the Roman Empire. That was that iron empire that broke in pieces and so forth. Jesus Christ came to this earth for the first time during that Roman Empire. At the time of Christ, Rome was the power there was no threat to them. They were absolute power at that time. So basically, if we were to kind of oversimplify things in a sense though, you know, basically the Persians defeat the Babylonians, the Greeks defeat the Persians, the Romans defeat the Greeks. That's correct. And that's the succession of kind of four great empires. That is the four greatest empires that the world's ever known. So let me ask you this, if between Daniel's time and the time of our Lord Jesus Christ, the geography changed multiple times. Wouldn't it make sense that over the last 2,000 years, it could have changed also? I think that a lot of Christians, when they think about you know, Babylon the Great, and they think about you know, the, the old Roman Empire, in their minds, that's where, that's where it stops. They don't think about the spirit of Babylon being alive and well today. The great whore is that spirit of Babylon, and the Bible says that the whore sitteth upon many waters. Then later in chapter 17 he says, the waters which thou sawest where the whore sitteth are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. So this spirit of Babylon is not restricted to one geographic location, but the whore sits upon many waters. First, the power was centralized in Babylon, but then it's moved to Shushan. So if you were living in the days of Esther, if you're living in the days of Ezra and Nehemiah, you would see the center of globalist power, not as being Babylon, but as being in Shushan, or as modern scholars call it, Susa. Obviously, Rome is a completely different geographic location, than Babylon, but it's part of the same system, the same spirit, the same idea of Babylon is continued on. Now let's ask ourselves this question. Is Rome, Italy today ruling over the world? Is that really the seat of governance in this world? I don't think that the global government is based in Rome, Italy. Now there are people out there who think the Catholic Church is running the world, you know, and the Jesuits and it's a big conspiracy. I personally don't believe that. I don't believe that they have the power that they used to have. They used to have that kind of power, didn't they? I mean, back in the Middle Ages, I mean, they would put the crown on somebody's head. And in fact, it was a great turning point in human history when Napoleon actually took the crown out of the Pope's hand. When the Pope came to crown him, he took it out of his hand, put it on his own head. Basically showing him, I'm in charge, not you. So the bottom line is, that was a decline in the power of the Catholic Church, and we've continued to see a decline in their power and influence as far as global affairs go. So the question is then, where is Babylon today in the 21st century? Where's the base, the headquarters of, of the empire? Mm -hmm. There is no objective way to look at it and not come to the conclusion that it's Washington, D.C. This is the seat of global power. This is the seat of military might. And the United States of America today is the new Babylon. It's the new Roman Empire. It is the seat of globalist power. It is a world superpower. Smoke, 
Three pairs, 105, two pairs. All right, sit tight, we'll get to you as soon as we can. Stay up at the smoke three pair, man. That's all we need, that's all we can do. We, we, we're Where are you? Which one are you guys up to? We're getting there, we're getting there. There's a few like it, man. I got one or two. I understand that, sir. We're on the way. Stay up at the smoke three pair, it's black, it's iron. My wife thinks I'm all right. I told him, said I was leaving the building. I was fine. I'm fine. Two tables, two broken windows. attacks which were carried out yesterday against our country were more than acts of terror they were acts of war they will either succeed in changing our way of life or we'll succeed in changing theirs for states that support terror it's not enough that the consequences be costly they must be devastating we're here for more than just the price of a gallon of gas. What we're doing is going to chart the future of the world for the next hundred years. Our war on terror begins with Al-Qaeda, but it does not end there. ويعتقلون النساء ويقتلون الأطفال ويهيلون الشيوخ ويقتلون الشباب أمريكا بحالها هي الإرهاب هي الإرهاب الإرهاب الأمريكي النجس الحقيقي We're striking with greater effectiveness at greater range more and more our weapons can hit moving targets. The weapons that are being used today have a degree of precision that no one ever dreamt of. This will be a campaign unlike any other in history. A campaign characterized by the employment of precise munitions on a scale never before seen. <laughs> We are trying to create a world government. How is that different from what the Assyrians tried to do? How is that different from what the Babylonians attempted to do? The Chaldeans? How is that different from what Greece, what Rome? I mean, how is it different from any great empire? It was the same ideology. What if our foreign policy of the past century is deeply flawed and has not served our national security interests? What if we wake up one day and realize that the terrorist threat 
is a predictable consequence of our meddling in the affairs of others and has nothing to do with us being free and prosperous. What if occupying countries like Iraq and Afghanistan and bombing Pakistan is directly related to the hatred directed toward us? What if conservatives who preach small government wake up and realize that our interventionist foreign policy provides the greatest incentive to expand the government? What if conservatives understood once again that their only logical position is to reject military intervention and managing an empire throughout the world? What if the American people woke up and understood that the official reasons for going to war are almost always based on lies and promoted by war propaganda in order to serve special interests? What if we as a nation came to realize that the quest for empire eventually destroys all great nations? What if war and preparation for war is a racket serving the special interests? What if Christianity actually teaches peace and not preventive wars of aggression? What if diplomacy is found to be superior to bombs and bribes in protecting America? What happens if my concerns are completely unfounded? Nothing. But what happens if my concerns are justified and ignored? Nothing good. And I yield back the balance of my time. The military-industrial complex, of course, is a phrase that was given to us uh, by former President Eisenhower. From the White House in the office of the President of the United States, we present an address by Dwight D. Eisenhower. Good evening, my fellow Americans. This evening, I come to you with a message of leave-taking and farewell. The military-industrial complex is referring to the unholy union between business and the military where there are industries and commercial enterprises that are supplying weapons, armaments, etc., that have an ulterior motive to keep warfare going so that they can keep on making money. They want to stay in business, and since their business is warfare, then they will manipulate politicians to keep these conflicts going so that they can keep selling the weapons, they can keep selling the tanks and the bombs and the missiles. We now stand 10 years past the midpoint of a century that has witnessed four major wars among great nations. Three of these involved our own country. We have been compelled to create a permanent armaments industry of vast proportions. Three and a half million men and women are directly engaged in the defense establishment. The total influence, economic, political, even spiritual, is felt in every city, every state house, every office of the federal government. We recognize the imperative need for this development, yet we must not fail to comprehend its grave implications. In the councils of government, we must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The potential for the disastrous rise of misplaced power exists and will persist. We must never let the weight of this combination endanger our liberties or democratic processes. Only an alert and knowledgeable citizenry can compel the proper meshing of the huge industrial and military machinery of defense with our peaceful methods and goals. I think that ought to be required reading like the uh, Gettysburg Address. That's how important it is, because right. we have been ruled by a military-industrial complex. He wouldn't have used the word conspiracy, but there's an element of believing that it's the interlocking uh, financial interests that are leading the purpose of the United States. It's a conflict of interest yeah, when you're right. making money off of warfare, and then let's say the war is coming to an end. Yes. Someone who's greedy, who loves money, could say, well, maybe we can keep this going or start a war somewhere else and, and basically just be in a state of perpetual warfare. War on this, war on well, that. Well, it's to the point where it's nonstop, where one enemy disappears and it's like, oh, we gotta find a new enemy. Yeah, yeah. even if the enemy doesn't exist, you'll find him. <laughs> because otherwise the, the military industrial complex is gonna come to a grinding halt. The military industrial complex is appropriately named, I think, because it represents the two groups in our modern society that have a vested interest 
in the continuation of war. It's as simple as that and as frightening as that. When you have powerful uh, political and economic interests in a country that benefit from war, you've got a very dangerous situation because that means you're probably going to be involved in war and more war and perhaps perpetual war. My fellow Americans, not long ago I received a letter from a woman in the Midwest. She wrote, Dear Mr. President, in my humble way I am writing to you about the crisis in Vietnam. I have a son who is now in Vietnam. My husband served in World War II. Our country was at war. But now, this time, it's just something that I don't understand. Why? Our role is to help the Lebanese put their country together. U.S. forces are engaged in action in Panama. Today, our armed forces joined our NATO allies in airstrikes against Serbian forces. In recent months, we have bombed Serbia, Bulgaria, Kosovo, Afghanistan, Sudan, Iraq, and China. The Americans say they are bringing you freedom. Where is this freedom? Where is it? It is a business for controlling the people, whether it be the people in this country or the people in other countries. It is in our vital national interest to send an additional 30,000 U.S. troops to Afghanistan. The military is now recommending sending several thousand more service members overseas. Military advisors say it's an effort to take out the Taliban. What I do is I authorize my military. That's why they've been so successful lately. It comes just weeks after the U.S. dropped the so-called mother of all bombs in Afghanistan, the largest non-nuclear bomb ever deployed, where dozens of ISIS militants were killed. It's, it's estimated, conservatively speaking, that the United States over the last two or three decades has killed over a million innocent men, women, and children, mostly in the Middle East. Now, you know, it's hard to comprehend that. And as Americans, we don't like to think about that. And the news media doesn't tell us that because they don't want us to know that. Because they don't want the American people to realize that we have that much blood on our hands as taxpayers. And that this is what our military industrial complex is doing. And this is what our so-called war on terror is doing. I mean, if you study the history of Alexander the Great, the Roman Empire, they actually thought that they're doing the world a favor. So there's something within human nature that wants to be a part of this great empire that's bringing the light to the world and we're conquering the world and spreading our way of life throughout the world. It's always been around. That spirit, that attitude has always been there. They looked at the whole rest of the world as just being barbaric and they don't know what's good for them. They thought that Rome was the greatest civilization in the world. So they said, you know, Rome is the light and we need to bring the light into the darkness of this world. They need us to come in and bring civilization. And this is the exact same mentality that the United States has today, where we say that our way of life and our form of government is superior to everyone else. So therefore we're gonna come in and we're gonna overthrow these governments and install a government that does things our way. But see, a lot of this is just propaganda, where we're getting this message at home here in the United States that's telling us, oh man, these people are so bad, we've got to go in and defeat these people and, and show them a better way of life. But this is what the, the Greeks said, this is what Alexander the Great said, this is what the Romans said. This is the mentality of world empire. On the back of a postage stamp, what's an empire? An empire is a group of nations or peoples all being ruled under one government. Would you consider the United States an empire then? Certainly, certainly. I mean, that's the basic point. I do, uh, and, and I think a lot of historians do. We truly are behaving as a global empire. It's probably the only real empire. By any definition of the word, the United States is an empire today. It's huge, it dominates the world, it has its way, nobody's uh, able to challenge it. Whatever it says is good for the world, that's what the world will do. 
That's not to say that everything it does in the world is bad, but it is to say that it can do whatever it chooses, good or bad, and no one dares say it's bad. All of the elements of empire are present in the United States today. Can there be any doubt that the United States is the most powerful nation in the world? I don't think so. You go around the world, they, everybody seems to know it. Because English is the that's global it. language. That is, that's right. I mean, if the world were to ever speak one language, it would be English. That's right. And that's pretty clear. That's right, yes. That's Indeed. huge. Yes. Yeah. Wow. America is, I think, the most powerful nation in the world. There really is no globalization without the United States. There is no United Nations without the United States. It, everything that, that smacks of world power, politics, economy, military, it all depends on the force of the United States of America. The United States has all of those elements of empire, and including one that many people don't even think about. And that element is that all empires come to an end. They usually come to an end rather viciously. They fall apart. They're destroyed. And that element, too, is present in the United States. Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus that you raise up a man for such a time as this. God, we ask you right now that your choice is this choice. We believe, Lord God, that you ordain things. You said all authority is of you. Now, God, I ask that you would touch this man, Donald J. Trump. Give him the anointing to lead this nation. Breaking tonight, two weeks into a Donald Trump presidency, and we are already seeing signs of a new world order. This is a new world order that Trump has put in place because he's an advocate. It's not, it's not just liberals who do that, John. It's not just liberals who do that. With Trump, I think you see the, the possibility, uh, really for the first time ever, of a new world order that involves an even closer than before merger between the corporation and the state. The presidents in America are not elected, they are chosen beforehand. That's a bold statement. That's a bold statement. And they know already in America who's going to win this one. They know whether it's Bush or Gore. Both men, by the way, are world government people, but my guess is Bush will get it because he belongs to the Skull and Bone Society. At the moment, Gore's ahead in the polls, but I still think Bush will get it. But either way, the, the New World Order Society <coughs> wins. Do you welcome the end of President Obama's term of office? It means nothing for us, because if you change administration, but you don't you change politics, it means nothing. So it's about the politics. And in Syria, we never bet on any president coming or any president going. We never bet, because what they say in their campaign is different from what they practice after they became elected. So there will be a new president. There are two main choices. One of them is Donald Trump. What do you know of Mr. Trump? Nothing, just what I heard in the media and uh, during the campaign. That's what I say, we don't have to waste our time hearing what they say in their campaign. They're going to change after they become elected and this is where we have to start evaluating uh, the president after the campaign, not during the campaign. The regime of Bashar al-Assad must come to an end. It's time for Assad to get out of the way. So the message to President Assad is it is time for transition, it is time for you to go. Assad has to go. And I will tell you that my attitude toward Syria and Assad has changed very much. In the span of a week, Trump has also changed his mind on the NATO alliance, now viewing it as a tool to counter Russian aggression in Europe. I said it was obsolete. It's no longer obsolete. So will you and President Trump organize an international coalition to remove Assad? Those steps are underway. There is no doubt the Syrian regime is responsible for the decision to attack and for the attack itself. The United States knows that Iraq has weapons of mass destruction. They know that those warplanes dropped bombs in this area of Idlib province at the time of the attack. There is no doubt that Saddam Hussein now has weapons of mass destruction. There is no doubt in the minds of U.S. military and intelligence analysts that Bashar al-Assad's regime did carry out this attack. 
Just in the past two weeks, the world witnessed the strength and resolve of our new president in actions taken in Syria and Afghanistan. North Korea would do well not to test his resolve or the strength of the armed forces of the United States in this region. I am tempted to quote the great Leonard Cohen. I'm guided by the beauty of our weapons. Tonight I ordered a targeted military strike on the airfield in Syria from where the chemical attack was launched. The goal for the United States is twofold. As I've stated, it's one, to make sure that we destabilize Syria. The West, mainly the United States, they fabricated the whole story in order to have a pretext for the attack. This play that they staged doesn't hold together. The story is not convincing by any means. We don't know whether those dead children were they killed in Khan Shaykhun, were they dead at all, uh, uh, who committed the attack if there was attack, what the material, you have no information at all, nothing at all, no one investigated. So you think it's a fabrication? Uh, definitely, 100% for us it's fabrication. We need America as the world's policeman. We need determined American global leadership. I'm going to bomb the out of them. It's true. I don't care. I don't care. They've got to be stopped. Airstrikes. Bomb them. Bomb them. Keep bombing them. Bomb them again and again. And that's right. I'd blow up the pipes. I'd blow up the refi. I'd blow up every single inch. There would be nothing left. And you know what? You'll get Exxon to come in there in two months. You ever see these guys, how good they are, the great oil companies? They'll rebuild that sucker brand new. It'll be beautiful. And I'd ring it, and I'd take the oil. You have to take out their families. When you get these terrorists, you have to take out their families. They, they care about their lives. Don't kid yourself. Mr. But they say they don't care about their lives. You have to take out their families. We ask you, God, to bless him, keep him safe, give him the wisdom and the strength to lead this great nation. In Jesus' name, amen. The great conspirator is Satan. He's the one that is manipulating governments. In Daniel chapter 10, we have a great example of how demonic forces work in the governments of the world. In verse number 12, the Bible reads, Then said he unto me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that thou didst set thine heart to understand and to chasten thyself before thy God, thy words were heard, and I am come for thy words. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and twenty days, but lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me and I remain there with the kings of Persia. Now very clearly when it references Michael, this is talking about Michael the archangel. And we could see that there's a battle going on between Michael and the princes of Persia. Now the prince of Persia is not talking about a human being, it's talking about the demonic forces that actually are controlling the power behind the government of Persia. Verse 20, then said he, knowest thou wherefore I come unto thee? And now will I return to fight with the prince of Persia and when I am gone forth, lo, the prince of Grecia shall come. But I will show thee that which is noted in the scripture of truth. And there is none that holdeth with me in these things, but Michael, your prince. Now you say, what is it? You know, Michael, your prince, the prince of Persia, the prince of Grecia. Who are these princes? Well, keep your finger there and flip over to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6, a very famous scripture here that will shed some light on this strange battling and wrangling that we see going on in Daniel chapter 10, where Gabriel and Michael are fighting against the prince of Persia and the prince of Grecia. The Bible says, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against what? Principalities, principalities and powers against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. God is telling us in the New Testament that there is a spiritual battle going on, a spiritual wrestling, and that wrestling is with principalities. It's with powers. Who are these principalities? They are the rulers of the darkness of this world. 
They are and represent spiritual wickedness in high places. Now, where are we going with this? What I want to show you here is that whether it's Babylon or Persia or Grecia or whether it's the Roman Empire, it is demonic. There are demons that are behind these leaders. There are devils that are actually calling the shots and actually motivating this globalist conquest. And the Bible even says, if you flip over to Ephesians chapter 2, he talks about those that are not saved in verse 1, and you at the quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the what? The prince. the prince. Satan is called the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. There was a spirit at work in Babylon, a spirit at work with Persia and the Greeks and with the Romans. That same spirit and demonic influence was present in all of these empires. They were actually run by Satan. That's why Satan is called the God of this world. Satan is of this world. He is the God, small g, not a capital. He is the God of this world. It is he and his horrible uh, uh, dark angels that we contend with. We talked about the demon that ran Persia. There's a demon running the United States. Yeah, right. The prince of the United States. <laughs> the prince of Washington, D.C. The prince of the United States of America. They have a big obelisk unto him. Washington, D.C. is probably the most significant city in the world. It's a world that's built for Satan. We see a wonderful historic day for the nation and the Freemasons of the United States of America are most privileged and happy to be able to participate in this momentous event. We are beginning our day as we do in Freemasonry uh, with the thought of God. In order to be a Freemason, one must not belong to any particular religion, but he must believe in a supreme being in some form. Senator Thurman, members of Congress, most worshipful Grand Masters, my brother Masons, and my fellow Americans. Today, is a most sacred and special occasion for all of us. 200 years ago, beneath this hallowed sanctuary, the Capitol cornerstone was laid by President and then Grand Master of Freemasons, George Washington. The inauguration of George Washington had taken place on April 30th of that year, on the Bible which is here this morning through the courtesy of St. John's Lodge Number 1. This is the same Bible upon which Presidents Clinton, Bush, Carter, and George Washington were inaugurated president. The story of how uh, Washington, D.C. came to be is very interesting. Washington, D.C. was originally farmland. This was chosen, of course, by Jefferson and Washington and others to be the site of the new capital of the United States. But Thomas Jefferson uh, knew that this great city needed a full-time architect. He would be the one who watched over it, but he obtained the services of a man from France, a Freemason named Pierre Lefant. Pierre Lafont was a man who knew the Masonic occult world. He knew what he was designated to do. He uh, sought to build a, a, a city which was shaped in the form of a pentagram. The first time I heard that, you know what I did? I went on Google Earth, because I don't just believe everything I hear. I went on Google Earth. I didn't even look at a map. I looked at Google Earth and just zoomed in with a satellite image on that, uh, and I said, there it is. I mean, it's, you'd have to be blind not to see it. I was thinking like, okay, how am I gonna find it? And there was just, it's right there. You can't miss it. Do 
The United States of America has historically been a Christian nation in the sense that most of the people who live here have claimed the name of Jesus Christ. But when it comes to our government, when it comes to our leaders, it's a completely different story. They are not Christian at all. All you have to do is just walk around Washington, D.C. The city of Washington, D.C. is loaded with images and idols and obelisks, that, you know, satanic symbols and stuff like that. Of course, the whole world knows the name Washington, D.C. What does it mean? Well, of course, it's named after George Washington, uh, the uh, general who defeated the uh, English in the American Revolution. Washington, D.C. But there's a D.C., a District of Columbia, after the name of Washington. What is the District of Columbia? You know, a lot of people have seen Columbia pictures. They see the, the logo when the woman comes out and, and the beautiful woman and she's holding a great flame in her hand or a great light, the great torch, the, the, the torch of knowledge of light because Satan comes as an angel of light. That's his light. She's his goddess and she's holding up that light. But why would the District of Columbus be called that? Why not the District of Christ? You know, yeah, it's, it's well, the there District you, of Columbia, there a you false go. goddess. There you go, a and false it's goddess. It's just a totally pagan place. A, a totally Everywhere pagan place. you turn is paganism. That's right. Then go to the individual state capitals and you'll find the same idolatry. I remember as a child touring the state capital in Sacramento, California and seeing the seal of the great state of California, which is Athena. And here's a statue of Athena. And here's another statue of Athena. And look at the capitals of the states themselves. I mean, in fact, even the symbol of our nation is a graven image because the Statue of Liberty is a graven image by anybody's definition. It is a carved image of man. Now you say, well, it's a woman. But here's the thing. It's a man that's dressed up as a woman. I'm not kidding. You think I'm kidding, but I'm not. See, Lady Liberty is actually patterned after the Greek god Prometheus. That god right there is the, the light bearer or Lucifer even. The one who brings the light, who is the one who supposedly among the gods brought down knowledge, right? How, like, sort of like the knowledge of good and evil, perhaps. Like, hey, eat of that tree and, and you'll be like gods. He, Prometheus, was the one who did that. And that is a replica of Prometheus. They're all idols of Satan. That's what we have in Washington, D.C. They're beautiful. Oh, yes, they're beautiful. They're lovely. They're made of stone. But they are of the devil. There's a famous book published by Freemasonry in Washington, D.C. It's entitled 10,000 Famous Freemasons. That's the title of it. 10,000 Famous Freemasons. It's a great reference book. You'll find the names of astonishing people there. In fact, it seems that at least 14 U.S. presidents have been Freemasons. Some 35 Supreme Court judges have been Freemasons. And the numbers of governors and generals and senators and congressmen are innumerable. Laying the cornerstones of buildings which serve mankind is one of the world's most ancient customs. The cornerstones of the President's House, known to us as the White House, the Washington Monument, the Smithsonian, Independence Hall in Philadelphia, incidentally by pa past Grandmaster Benjamin Franklin, and Constitution Hall stand out among many others as outstanding examples of cornerstones which have been laid Masonically. The Washington Monument, that giant obelisk, is based on an obelisk from the 14th century BC, ancient Egypt. Now, why would we have an obelisk in Washington, DC? Look at the word itself, obelisk. Notice it has the word bell in it, obelisk. Look down at your Bible in Jeremiah chapter 50, and it says, declare ye among the nations and publish and set up a standard, publish and conceal not. Say, Babylon is taken, Baal is confounded. You see, Baal was their false god. Notice that the obelisk stands in the midst of a great circle. The obelisk is in fact the phallus symbol, the phallus symbol. 
It's the phallus of the great sun god, the great architect. He is the one who designs the world, and it is his architecture that reigns. You will find an obelisk right before the Vatican in Rome. You will find one in London. You'll find also, of course, throughout Egypt, the obelisk. You'll even go to New York. You can go to Central Park, and you'll see the, the needle of Cleopatra, so-called. So the occult world has placed these obelisks in the major cities across this globe. But in Washington, D.C. is the primary obelisk. Know all of you who hear me, we proclaim ourselves free and lawful Masons. We are met in open day under the broad canopy of heaven to lay the cornerstone of this building, symbol of freedom to our citizens. May the Lord prosper our handiwork and may this building continue for centuries as a credit to the nation and a blessing to the citizens thereof. You know, Jefferson not only helped to design, along with Lafont, the capital of the United States, but Jefferson also helped to design the great seal of the United States. Take out your $1 bill, the most common currency of the United States. There you will see the hidden side of the great seal. And there you have a great pyramid, the Egyptian pyramid. And directly above the pyramid is an all-seeing eye and a, inside a triangle. That all-seeing eye is the eye of Horus, the son of the sun god. What is America doing with the sign of Osiris and his son Horus and their great pyramid. Now, there is a motto also uh, to the reverse side of the great seal. It's E Pluribus Unum. The motto of our nation, E Pluribus Unum, is in Latin, which is the language of the Roman Empire. And it says, out of many, one. And if you think about it, that's exactly what the New World Order is. It's many nations coming together into one nation. It's many religions coming together into one religion. It's many different currencies and financial systems all joining together into one. Out of many, one. A pluribus unum. And when we think about that motto, out of many, one, think about the New World Order. It's many nations becoming one. Out of many religions, one. Out of many financial currencies, one. People may also be thinking, well, does it really matter that these are on the back of an American dollar or any other currency for that matter? What is the significance? I wouldn't have known the answer to that question had I not had meetings in Seattle, Washington. One afternoon I was walking into a building and a girl came in carrying a large volume called The Secret Teachings of All Ages by Manly Hall, a top Freemason writer. And when I saw the book, I got excited. I said, how much for your book, dear? She said, $20. So I paid her 20 American and I got the book. And I trust she bought another one. When I took that book home, I discovered much of the answers to my problems. Um, for example, he said there in that book that when America was settled, it was settled by two groups of people, the Pilgrim Fathers, and that's why we read here, in God we trust, they settled America for religious freedom. He said, at the same time, a group of occultists and Freemasons settled it for a peculiar and a particular purpose known only to the initiated few. The initiated few are called in Freemasonry in the top degrees, the adepts, the elect and the sages. These men settled it for the main purpose of putting Lucifer, the God of Freemasonry, on the throne of the world. According to the Freemason world, they have a plan, an agenda. They believe that agenda will be worked out when finally the United States meets its destiny. What is to be the destiny of the United States? It's not democracy. It's not freedom. We are to be the Masonic capstone of this world. We're to represent the Freemasons. They will become the lords of earth. And we shall be a subservient people. This is the hidden agenda 
This is the secret destiny of America. But it's been clothed in stone, uh, in the stone idols and statues and buildings and architecture of Washington, D.C. In Revelation 17 and 18, when God is talking in the end times about Babylon, we know he's not talking about the literal city of Babylon because that city no longer exists. It's just a ruin now. Not a single person lives there. So he's using the term Babylon to refer to a different nation. Why? Because it's a nation that's like Babylon. Just like in the book of Isaiah, when he called the nation of Judah, Sodom. And he said, listen, you rulers of Sodom. He's talking to the rulers of Judah. Why? Because they had become like unto Sodom. They had a lot of the same attributes, a lot of the same perversion and abominations that Sodom had. So whoever God's referring to as Babylon in the book of Revelation would be a nation that is like Babylon. Well, what was Babylon like? Babylon was a place where people lived a very lavish, luxurious lifestyle. They had a lot of money. They had a lot of wealth. They had a lot of comfort. They were a great consumer of goods. They were also a global empire. They had a great military. They had the greatest military in the world at that time. They had the largest empire in the world. And the nations that carried that torch thereafter, Persia, Greece, and Rome, they were the same way. They were the new Babylon. And today in the 21st century, the nation that fits that description is the United States of America. We have all the attributes of Babylon. There should be no confusion or misunderstanding about Babylon because the mystery has already been revealed. As the Bible says in Revelation 17, verse number seven, and the angel said unto me, wherefore didst thou marvel? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carrieth her, which hath the seven heads and 10 horns. The beast that thou sawest was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, when they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. And here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. I went on Wikipedia and there was a list of about 80 or 90 cities that claim to be built on seven hills. People have said, well, Mecca's built on seven hills, Jerusalem's built on seven hills. But yet, even though a lot of cities claim to be built on seven hills, there's only one city that has been historically known as the city of seven hills, and that's Rome. So there's really no question about the connection between Rome and Babylon. But here's the thing, that is not the only interpretation of this verse, and, and in fact, I don't even think it's the primary interpretation, but it is there. So I'm not saying that people who've preached that are wrong. I think they were right. But I think that they're missing something even bigger. Often in the Bible, when it uses the term mountain, it's referring to a kingdom. So when the Bible says there are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth, it's referring to the great whore occupying seven different kingdoms or seven different empires. Then he says there are seven kings to go with those kingdoms. He says, five are fallen, one is, and the other is not yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. Well, look at John's perspective here. He says that there are seven kings. Five are fallen. Now, what are the five that were fallen? That would be Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Persia, and Greece. One is, that's the Roman Empire. He's living during the Roman Empire. And the other is not yet come. So there's a future seventh kingdom that is after the Roman Empire, a seventh kingdom that's coming where the whore will operate. And look what the Bible says about the seventh kingdom. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. So is the seventh kingdom gonna last as long as the first six did? It's only gonna last a very short time. And look what the eighth is, because the Bible says, the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth. But watch this, and is of the seven. So what happens is the seventh kingdom is going to be an end times global world empire. Okay? The seventh king is going to be the man of sin who is killed, right? And then when he is brought back, 
That's the eighth, and that is the Antichrist. Because he's not the Antichrist until he comes from hell. First, there is going to be a normal man, a normal world leader, the man of sin. That man is the seventh king of the seventh kingdom. He will die, and then the eighth will come, who is of the seven, because it's basically that guy, whether it's, you know, just Satan possessing his body, or, you know, we don't know exact details, but we know he dies and comes back somehow, whether he's alive or undead, you know, whatever you want to look at it with that. But do you see how this scripture comes clear? Right. Once you see that, the Bible says in verse 12, the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet, but received power as kings one hour with the beast. Look at verse 13. These have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. Now, when have you ever found ten kings or ten world leaders who all have one mind? They all agree on something. You know, this is ten world leaders. And think about... There are, you know, different conferences like this that happen now, aren't there? Isn't there one called the G10, the G12, the G20, the G5? Or, you know, it's, it's different numbers depending on how many of them are assembling at that given time. Well, what the Bible is teaching is that one day there's going to be like a G10 summit here where these 10 leaders of the world, these 10 kings, as the Bible calls them, are going to get together and they're going to decide to basically just hand all the power over to the Antichrist. Just hand it all over to one guy. It says in verse 14, these shall make war with the Lamb, meaning they're going to make war with Jesus. And the Lamb shall overcome them, for he is Lord of lords and King of kings. And they that are with them are called and chosen and faithful. And he saith unto me, The waters which thou sawest where the whore sitteth are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. And the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore. So these are ten literal men, ten leaders. It says they shall hate the whore and shall make her desolate and naked and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. For God hath put in their hearts to fulfill his will and to agree and give their kingdom unto the beast until the words of God shall be fulfilled. Now, here's the thing. In Revelation 18, we're about to read about Babylon being burned with fire. Revelation 17 is setting the stage for that, explaining to us the background and who Babylon is. Now, the Bible says here that the 10 kings are the ones that are going to burn Babylon with fire. So when we read in chapter 18 about Babylon being burned with fire and being made desolate, Who's doing it according to the Bible? The 10 kings, which have one mind with who? Who are they united with? Do they have different views from the Antichrist? Are they kind of doing their own thing and the Antichrist is doing his thing? No, no, no. These have one mind. They give him his power and his strength. He rules by their permission. They hate the whore. So who is it that's going to destroy Babylon? According to the Bible here, it's the 10 kings, the coalition of 10 kings will destroy Babylon. Notice how the Bible describes Babylon as a great whore. A great whore. It's capitalized. What is a whore? A whore is not one that you love. If you loved her, you'd marry her. A whore is one that you use and abuse and discard when you're done. Think about the United States. Do a lot of people benefit from the United States? Do they not benefit from the abundance of our delicacies? Aren't we sending money to people all over the world, foreign aid all over the world? Don't they use our military to fight their battles and to defend their country? We are used. The United States is being used by people all over the world. But let me ask this. Does the world love us? Travel around the world and ask these countries, hey, do you love America? No. Hey, do you love America? No. They don't like us in a lot of these places, but they'll take the money. They don't like us, but they'll screw us. And that's exactly what a whore is. And I'm telling you, it fits the bill perfectly with the United States. And when the Antichrist is done with the United States, you know what he's going to do? Discard it. But they'll use the whore to get in power. Why? Because how can the Antichrist get in power without the military might of the United States? How can the Antichrist get in power without our technology, without our infrastructure of world government that's already set up? But then once he's done with it, then God wants to destroy and punish the United States. So he uses the 10 kings. He uses the Antichrist to destroy the United States. 
Revelation 18 and verse 1 says this, And after these things I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit, and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. So here we see the destruction of Babylon. He says, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen. Notice verse 3, for all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not her plagues, for her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. Reward her even as she rewarded you, and double unto her double according to her works, in the cup which she hath filled, filled to her double. How much she hath glorified herself, and lived deliciously, so much torment and sorrow give her. For she saith in her heart, I sit a queen and am no widow and shall see no sorrow. Therefore shall her plagues come in one day, death and mourning and famine, and she shall be utterly burned with fire. For strong is the Lord God who judgeth her. So notice again the parallel with the United States, this attitude of we're so powerful, Nothing bad could ever happen to us. We have the most powerful military in the world. We can never be judged. We can never be defeated. This attitude that just belligerently spits in the face of God and expects nothing to happen. I mean, we think that we can just murder 3,000 babies a day and that God's just gonna kind of look the other way as we shed all this innocent blood. Or we think that we can go out and, and bomb all these other countries and drone attack on men, women, and children and that somehow that's all just gonna be forgotten of the Lord. But let me tell you something, there is gonna be a consequence. First of all, the Bible teaches that there is a physical destruction that is gonna come upon our nation, the United States of America. Even in this lifetime, it could happen. And the kings of the earth who have committed fornication and lived deliciously with her shall bewail her and lament for her when they shall see the smoke of her burning. So I want you to understand the description that's being given here. We're being told of a nation that's destroyed in one day. And we're told of the fact that people will be able to see the smoke of her burning. Verse 10, standing afar off for fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, that great city Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour is thy judgment come. So people are looking at this city and saying, she wasn't just destroyed in one day, she was destroyed in one hour. And the merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn over her, for no man buyeth their merchandise anymore. And they're not crying like, oh, the loss of life. Oh, the humanity. Oh, the people dying. It says they're weeping and mourning repeatedly, it says, because nobody's buying their junk. I mean, that's why, ah, what am I gonna do with all this stuff? The Dollar Tree's not there anymore. You know, there's no, there's no Dollar Tree, no Walmart, no Americans just buy stuff and throw it away. So therefore, you know, this fits perfectly with the United States when we look at this in Revelation 18. I mean, who could you say that about except the United States. I mean, if this were to happen any time in the near future, how could you say that about anyone else? The United States is the one who buys all the stuff that's produced by all the merchants of the world. I mean, look, if they're making stuff in Japan, if they're making stuff in Germany, if they're making stuff in China, they're making stuff in Vietnam, who do you think is their most important market? Who do we sell this to? Us, the United States. We are the greatest consumer nation in the world. If Jerusalem was destroyed, if Mecca was destroyed, if Rome was destroyed, would the merchants of the world be weeping and saying, no man buyeth our merchandise anymore? They'd say, hey, you know, turn the boat around. Let's go to the United States and drop all this stuff off at the Dollar Tree. Think about all the people that do business by shipping goods into the United States and all the made in China products that are brought over in great shipping containers on ships just so much merchandise, it boggles the mind. So you can see how this would just completely ruin that industry for the shipping companies. I mean, just here in Long Beach, California, at this one port, 
look at all the merchandise that's coming in. You can see how the Bible says, every shipmaster, all that trade by the sea. You can see why he uses that kind of language because we are the great importer. I mean, all this made in China stuff, just train boxcar upon boxcar, just ships full of it. I mean, look out the window, look at all this stuff. And this is just a fraction of what comes into this country on a daily basis, let alone other ports and other harbors of the United States, just bringing in so much merchandise. There is no other country in the world that even comes close to importing this much merchandise. And so it could only be said of the United States that because it was destroyed, no man buyeth our merchandise anymore. And here's the thing, that's not a minor point here. In fact, if you look at it, it's actually nine verses long, the part about the merchandise, where he's just talking about nothing but the merchandise. The sailors, the shipmasters, the merchants, the merchandise. This is a major point here that it's a great consumer nation. It says, uh, no man buyeth our merchandise anymore. The merchandise of gold and silver and precious stones and of pearls and fine linen and purple and silk and scarlet and all fine wood and all manner vessels of ivory and all manner vessels of most precious wood and of brass and iron and marble and cinnamon and odors, anointments and frankincense and wine. Do you notice these are luxuries? These aren't the necessities of life. Oil, wine, frankincense, cinnamon, you know, all these vessels of ivory and wood and all this ornate decoration. A few necessities mixed in, but the vast majority of it is a luxury product that's being brought in. The merchants of these things, which were made rich by her, shall stand afar off for the fear of her torment, weeping and wailing and saying, alas, alas, that great city that was clothed in fine linen and purple and scarlet and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, for in one hour so great riches has come to naught. And every shipmaster, is this saying some shipmasters? Every shipmaster and all the company and ships and sailors and as many as trade by sea. If that weren't important, then why did God repeat it three times in one verse? He's already said it in other verses. And then he says, let's just say it three more times in just this one verse. And every shipmaster and all the company and ships and sailors and as many as trade by sea stood afar off and cried when they saw the smoke of her burning, saying, what city is like unto this great city? And they cast dust on their heads and cried, weeping and wailing, saying, alas, alas, that great city, wherein were made rich all that had ships in the sea by reason of her costliness, for in one hour is she made desolate. Over and over again in Revelation 18, the Bible repeats the fact that Babylon will be destroyed in one hour and that it will be destroyed with fire, utterly burned and destroyed, and that there will be smoke that will be seen from very far off in the distance. A nuclear attack fits this description perfectly because a nuclear attack burns and destroys everything with fire and it would happen immediately. It would happen in one hour's time that it could be wiped out and decimated and you'd see the great smoke of a mushroom cloud coming up off in the distance. We see the shipmasters are afraid to get close. Why? They don't want the radiation. They don't want the nuclear fallout. They're standing afar off looking at the great smoke billowing up into the air. They see the burning and the fire and they're blown away how this great city could be destroyed in one hour. In the parallel passage in Jeremiah 51 verse 1, the Bible reads, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will raise up against Babylon and against them that dwell in the midst of them that rise up against me a destroying wind. And this is also consistent with a nuclear attack. Think about all the images you've ever seen of nuclear weapons being detonated. There's always that destroying wind that knocks over everything in its path. Remember the images of the trees all blowing over to one side? cars and buses and buildings being thrown over by that destroying wind that knocks over everything in its path. So we have the fire, the smoke, the destroying wind, the destruction in one hour. This could be accomplished with a nuclear weapon. You know, we've been able to, to keep nuclear weapons from use uh, since 1945 in uh, Nagasaki and Hiroshima, Japan. But we're closer today than we have been all these years to World War III in which these weapons are unveiled and used. The Cold War as we knew it may be over, 
but both the U.S. and Russia still keep enough nuclear weapons on alert to end civilization. Today, I believe that the likelihood of a nuclear catastrophe is actually greater, greater than it was during the Cold War. Nearly two football fields long, it is the deadliest engine of destruction in the American arsenal. Able to carry almost 200 nuclear warheads atop the missiles loaded beneath those hatches. The warheads that can be carried on my missiles are extremely powerful. And compare them to the bomb that leveled Hiroshima. Much more powerful than, than that. Much more powerful than Hiroshima. Up to 30 times more powerful. And on any given day, a number of these submarines are hiding somewhere in the world's oceans, ready to respond to a launch order from the president. How long, in fact, does the president have to make a decision? He has you know, minutes. If the weapons can be launched within minutes, does that mean we're still in the same old hair trigger yes. standoff that we were during the Cold War? That's right. We are, and we still have launch on warning, same policy we had then. We still have the same hair trigger response. So what's changed since the Cold War if we're still on this, this hair trigger alert? Fundamentally, nothing has changed. But the numbers of weapons are much lower now than during the Cold War. The number of weapons are sufficient to destroy, obliterate all of civilization. One of the things that comes up over and over again in the Jeremiah prophecy is that Babylon would be destroyed and never be inhabited again. God makes a big point about that. And when we look at Revelation 18, the end times Babylon, when it is destroyed, it will never be inhabited again. It's gonna be destroyed with fire. The Bible says that that destruction will come in one hour and that it will never be inhabited again. So think about that. The United States is going to be wiped out and never inhabited again. Jeremiah chapter 51 is a prophecy about the physical destruction of the original Babylon, literal Babylon, the Babylon of Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylon of Belshazzar, the literal city being destroyed. Look what the Bible says in Jeremiah chapter 51, beginning in verse number 60. So Jeremiah wrote in a book, all the evil that should come upon Babylon, even all these words that are written against Babylon. And Jeremiah said to Sariah, When thou comest to Babylon and shalt see and shalt read all these words, then shalt thou say, O Lord, thou hast spoken against this place to cut it off, that none shall remain in it, neither man nor beast, but that it shall be desolate forever. And it shall be, when thou hast made an end of reading this book, that thou shalt bind a stone to it, and cast it in the midst of Euphrates. And thou shalt say, Thus shall Babylon sink, and shall not rise from the evil that I will bring upon her, and they shall be weary. Thus far are the words of Jeremiah. So get the picture here. Sariah the scribe is sent by Jeremiah with the book of Jeremiah to read it in Babylon, to read it to the Babylonians, to warn them. And Sariah is told, to read the warning and to tell them of the evil that God's going to bring upon them. Then as soon as he's done reading, he takes the book that he's reading, he ties it to a great stone and throws it in the river. And they say, wait, I wanted to read that one more time. Nope. It goes into the, the river and he says, thus shall Babylon sink. And what did he say? It's never going to be inhabited. It's never going to be a nation again. It's never coming back. That's how Jeremiah ends his prophecy about Babylon. And that matches perfectly with the prophecy of Babylon in Revelation. Revelation 18, 21 says this, And a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and cast it into the sea, saying, Thus with violence shall that great city Babylon be thrown down and shall be found no more at all. All throughout the Bible, when you look at the destruction of Babylon, one thing is very clear, that Babylon is going to be destroyed and there will be no inhabitants in Babylon forever. So here's my question. What doesn't fit in Revelation 18? I mean, you just, you read through Revelation 18, it all fits. Sitting a queen, thinking nothing's bad going to happen, prideful, tons of riches, tons of wealth, the great importer of the world, the world empire. You say, well, when did, when did the U.S. kill the saints and prophets? Well, that's going to happen during the tribulation when the fifth seal is opened and the martyrs of Jesus are, are slaughtered worldwide. 
America is not the America of our fathers and grandfathers. It, it, sadly, it, you know, it breaks my heart to say that, but we have to be realistic here. America is not the America of our past. I see nothing in history that gives America a free get out of jail free card in this game. In other words, if we violate the rules that have destroyed other empires and other nations, I don't know why the consequences wouldn't be the same for us. Let me tell you something. You better take this seriously. No nation, look at Israel, or the biblical Israel in the Old Testament. They did not escape the judgment of God. Even as late in their history as having a good king like Josiah brought great revival. In spite of that revival, it wasn't long before the destruction came. You know, you and I don't know how much time we have. Uh, we may be gone tomorrow. We need to work for today. And every day when you get up, you need to ask yourself, what can I do for God today? And you need to ask yourself, what do, does my neighbor need? What do my friends need? What do those people out there who are lost, what do they need? You know what they need. They need the, 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 the saving touch of Jesus Christ. And you may be the only one that can give that to them. Maybe God has put you in the path of someone today. Please reach out to them. If you're watching this video and you do not know the Lord as your Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, God made flesh, you need to get saved because destruction is coming. And if you are a victim of that destruction, you will not only go straight from the fire of destruction here, but you'll go straight to the fires of hell. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, but he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. I mean, if you do not believe on Jesus Christ today, the Bible says that God's wrath is abiding on you right now. And if you're not saved, if you don't believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you'll be on the receiving end of this destruction. But not only that, after we die, the Bible teaches that anyone who does not believe on the Lord Jesus Christ will go to hell for all eternity to be punished for their sins. And if you're watching this film and you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ as your savior, this is your doom and destruction that's being prophesied in Revelation chapter 18. If I was not a Christian and I studied what's coming and this new world order and the government that's coming down on us rapidly, satanic mentality of Babylon, I would rush to the nearest place I could find and get saved. Find a piece of dirt to sit on or sit and kneel down and get next to your couch and say, Lord, I'm a sinner. Would you save me right now? We Christians are going to be in heaven by the time the final destruction of Babylon takes place. But woe unto anyone who is living in the United States of America when this happens. Friends, peace is not the future of the world. The Bible says when they shall say peace, then sudden destruction shall come upon them. Destruction. If you don't have Jesus Christ, in this great destruction that's to come upon this, this world, this country, you have nothing. Please, turn to Jesus while there's time.
But the main thing I want to talk to you about today is how to escape the wrath of God. How to escape the wrath of God. I don't think any of you here today wants to be on this earth when God pours out his wrath. Do you want to be there when this happens? None of you wants to face the wrath of God. I know I don't want to face the wrath of God. I want to experience the love of God. I don't want to experience the wrath of God. I don't want to be on this earth when God is raining hell and fire and brimstone and hail out of the sky and turning water into blood. Well, the Bible tells us how we can escape God's wrath. The Bible says in verse number 10 of 1 Thessalonians 1, And to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. The Bible says that Jesus can deliver us from the wrath to come. He has delivered us from the wrath to come if we believe in him. It also says in 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. The way to escape the wrath of God is to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, how do we get salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ? Well, the first thing we need to know is that we've all sinned before. Every single one of us has sinned. Nobody's perfect. Even if you've never been a murderer or a sorcerer, you've all lied before. I know I've lied. Put up your hand if you've lied before. Everybody has lied before. And myself, don't talk about it. Just put up your hand and put it back down again. So, we've all sinned, we've all lied, we've all done bad things. And the Bible says that the punishment for that is death. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. And after the physical death, the Bible talks about spiritual death. The Bible talks about a second death. It talks about going to a place called hell where you experience the wrath of God and fiery torment in hell. You don't want to go to hell and I don't want you to go to hell and God doesn't want you to go to hell. So that's why Jesus Christ died on the cross for us so that we would be saved and so that we don't have to go to hell. The Bible says, but God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So even though we've all sinned, even though we've all lied, even though the Bible tells us that all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death, because God loves us, he came to this earth in the form of Jesus and he lived a perfect life that none of us could live. Jesus never sinned. And Jesus performed a lot of miracles. For example, he walked on water, he healed the sick, he raised the dead back to life, but he also preached the word of God. And when he preached the word of God, a lot of people were offended and angry by his preaching. So therefore he was arrested. And when Jesus was arrested, they beat him up, they spit on him, they hit him in the head with a stick and then they nailed him to the cross. And when Jesus was on that cross, the Bible says that he himself bare our sins in his own body on the tree. So every sin you've ever done and every sin I've ever done, it was as if Jesus had done it. He was being punished for our sins. And when Jesus died on the cross, they took his body and buried it in a tomb. And then three days later, he rose again from the dead and he showed them the holes in his hands and the hole in his side to prove that he'd risen from the dead. Now, Jesus died for everybody in the whole world, but everybody's not going to heaven. There's one thing that we have to do in order to be saved. The Bible asks the question, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thy house. The one thing we must do to be saved is to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. The most famous verse in the Bible, John 3, 16 says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So the Bible tells us that if we believe on Jesus, we'll be saved, we'll have everlasting life. Now everlasting means forever. So when Jesus saves you, he doesn't save you for a little while, he saves you forever. So you only have to get saved one time. The Bible says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The gift of God is eternal life. God wants to save you today and being saved is as simple as receiving a free gift. The gift of God's eternal life. How do we get that gift? By believing on Jesus Christ. Now let's say I were gonna give you a gift today. If I were to give you these DVDs, for example, that we're giving out, if I were to give you a DVD and tell you, okay, now you have to give me $1,000, is that really a gift? 
What if I said, okay, I'll give you a gift, but you have to uh, do some work for me. Come wash my car. No, that's not a gift, is it? What if I gave you the DVD and then I came back two weeks later and I said, I need it back. I need you to give it back. That's not a gift. So two things about a gift. A gift is free and a gift is yours to keep. You don't have to give it back. It's yours to keep. So God said the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So once we receive that free gift of salvation by believing on Jesus, he's never going to take it away from us. Once we're saved, we're saved forever. It's impossible to lose your salvation because once you've believed on Jesus Christ, he gives you eternal life and he makes you the promise, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Jesus said, I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Once you believe on Jesus Christ, you are saved forever. Now, let's say after you believe on Jesus Christ, you do something really bad. Let's say you commit a really bad sin. Well, if you do that, then God's going to punish you because God will punish us on this earth for the sins that we do on this earth. But as long as we believe on Jesus Christ, we will still go to heaven because being saved is not based on how good we are because we've all sinned. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that's in Christ Jesus. So if we believe on Jesus, he forgives all of our sins. Now, Jesus died for us 2,000 years before we were even born. So that means that Jesus died for all of our sins, past, present, and future, before we even did them, because he died 2,000 years ago. That means if we believe on Jesus Christ today, he'll forgive all of our sins, and we will escape the wrath to come. He's delivered us from the wrath to come. Now, if you believe on Jesus, you're a child of God. You're a son or daughter of God. I have nine children. Now, yes, I really do. I have nine children at home. This guy in the green shirt is my oldest boy right here, but I, he has eight brothers and sisters. Now, if my son disobeys me, I'm going to punish him. I'm not just going to tell him it's okay. He's going to be punished. But I'm not going to kick him out of the family no matter what he does. No matter what he does, he's my son and I'm still going to love him. It's the same way with God. Once we believe on Jesus Christ, he'll never leave us. He'll never forsake us. He'll never kick us out of the family. So how many times do we have to get saved then? One time. Only once. Because once we're saved, we're always saved. We're saved for eternity. But... If we break God's commandments after we get saved, he'll discipline us. He'll punish us, just like I punished my son. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to get a whipping from God. I don't want to get punished by God. That's why I want to obey God's commandments, okay? But no matter what we do, once we believe on Jesus Christ, we have everlasting life, and he will never take that away from us. Now, today, I want to ask you a question, and I don't want you to talk. I just want you to raise your hand. If you here today believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins, that he was buried and that he rose again, and if you believe that Jesus is the only way to heaven and that you get to heaven just by believing on Jesus, put up your hand if you believe that right now. All right. Now go ahead and slip them down again. And what I want to do, if you believe that, if you believe Jesus is the only way to heaven, if you believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins and was buried and rose again, and that just by trusting in him is going to get you to heaven, just by believing in him, not based on how good we are, but based on how good he is, let's bow our heads and you can pray this prayer with me and say this directly to God. Close your eyes, bow your head. If you want to pray this prayer, if you believe that, just repeat after me and say to the Lord, Dear Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I know I deserve hell. But I believe that you died on the cross for all my sins and rose again. Please save me right now and give me eternal life. I'm only trusting you, Jesus. Thank you for delivering me from the wrath to come. Amen. Now, the Bible says that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. The Bible says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus 
and shall believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead. Thou shalt be saved. So according to the Bible, that's the one thing you must do to be saved is just believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you're saved forever. Thank God for his love and mercy and grace that saves us from the wrath to come. Thank you everyone for listening to what we have to say. God bless you.